a minute to prepare and a few people are leaving so we just leave them walk out. I'm gonna first of all call up the three panelists, three women, uh, Lorna McGregor, who is a professor of law at the University of Essex, was mentioned before. Uh, she's the director of the Human Rights Center there, and she also is uh, the leading uh, investigator, principal investigator of a big project about technology, big data, and uh, human rights. Uh, Lorna, welcome. Then we have Flynn Coleman, who comes from New York. She teaches at New York University. She's a human rights attorney, a social entrepreneur. Welcome. And Solange Granauti, who teaches cybersecurity at the University of Lausanne. Welcome. And I guess we need to give you one of these mics. So you have two of them. Solange, yours is there on the table. Uh, so, I thought that, first of all, I assume that we, you, you all think that this documentary is accurate, right? You haven't spotted any weakness in the documentary, <laughs> correct? Okay. So, I thought that the first thing to do is maybe to establish a sort of baseline, uh, because we all here have read now for several years uh, and heard about artificial intelligence. Uh, but uh, can uh, Flynn, maybe can you just give a, a definition of what AI really is so that everybody is on the same page? Absolutely. So AI, artificial intelligence, I think it's important to remember that of course we need to use language to communicate so that we can have a common understanding, but this is still something that's very much up for debate. So one definition of artificial intelligence or AI is that it's robotic software and computers with the capacity for intelligent behavior. Um, though some people prefer to use the word synthetic intelligence, others prefer augmented intelligence. So there's a lot of questions that remain, but it is somewhat of a buzzword. So I think while we need to figure out some terminology, it's important to recognize that these come labeled with things that might connote a certain feeling. One of the words most used in the movie was data. And of course, data is a key element of this, right? No data, no AI, lots of data, better AI. I think that, of course, they are related but not the same. And one helpful thing that's helped me understand is that, so big data and AI are different, but AI is what has helped unleash the power of big data because the data is a heap of data until you have something to analyze it. So that's one way to think about the connection. Uh, Lorna, what you've seen in the movie is a rather basic version of AI. It's essentially pattern recognition. I have a lot of data and the system goes through and figures out patterns and then defines the boxes in the neighborhoods and all these kind of things. Uh, we can say that that's just the beginning. It's really a basic, basic kind, of, kind of type. Um, yes, but I think that it's um, a very powerful type um, and the one that we're you know, very preoccupied with. Raises all the questions the already, moment. absolutely. Yeah. And I think the definition um, that Flynn's giving is a really important one to work with. And all I would add to that is the flip of what AI does to big data is that big data fuels um, AI. It, it, that's often the way in which it's used. So we're thinking about what might happen in the future as this big data continues to fuel the AI. So uh, in the at the beginning of the movie, there was a reference to Minority Report, and I assume that a lot of people here remember or have seen that uh, uh, movie with Tom, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, where uh, you know, crimes are basically predicted before they would happen, and people would be arrested for the assumed intention that they were about to commit a, a crime. Now, one thing that strikes me is that, uh, and, and, and the documentary says, Hollywood, has, reality has caught up with Hollywood. One thing that strikes me is that the Tom Cruise movie was set in 2054. Uh, so this technology is really going faster than Hollywood. Flynn. I think that yes, generally yes. So um, I think to be in the, in the business of prediction can be a dangerous one and it's important to think about it, but I think there's a lot of focus on that. So we don't exactly know what's coming and when it's coming, but we know something's coming. What we do know is that information technology and technology in general along the trajectory of human history has kind of grown with a very steep trajectory recently post-industrial revolution. So we know it's coming fast. Some people like Ray Kurzweil, who's a 
futurist, thinks that um, the singularity is coming very, very soon, um, in less than 30 years, actually, and some people think it's going to take a lot longer. So what we do know for sure is that we it's kind of an exponential growth of technology. We just don't know exactly when and how. Um, and a lot of people are certainly in the business of predicting that. And it definitely is coming on very fast. I think I would just say one more thing that would be interesting for all of us here, which is there is something called the AI effect, which is that we already have AI. It's already here in Netflix, it's already here in Google, but there is something about AI, and I have some theories I'm sure all of us do, as to why this happens. When we um, create or invent an AI, suddenly we decide it's not an AI anymore, and we're not quite there yet. What you're saying is that we're kind of you know, looking at the actual real embodiment of something like her in the movie Her, uh, and, and, and that's the real thing, and, and what we have is just uh, normal, normal stuff. Uh, Solange, on effet, on, on, est, on est totalement entouré de... Solange, in the film, uh, you see that we are all surrounded by artificial intelligence uh, and uh, different ways, uh, uh, intelligent uh, cars, uh, drones, etc. They're part of our life already. Yes, indeed. Uh, and we have contributed to building this uh, electronic and uh, uh, computer uh, world. And we all connect it all the time. And this uh, uh, can uh, help um, optimize uh, reasoning. The link with uh, predictive uh, technologies is the capacity for these systems to make deductions uh, and reasonings, and that uh, closes people into boxes, uh, and it's difficult to get out of these boxes. The basic issue for me is the link between commercial interest and uh, um, sovereign uh, um, powers from the state. The uh, algorithm are sometimes very obscure, and uh, this is, in a way, a manipulation of uh, opinions in the police among uh, political leaders and uh, we are made to behave ourselves uh, as the algorithm tell us to behave ourselves so again you are a specialist of uh, cyber security and uh, I think everybody is uh, wondering what the uh, uh, technology uh, uh, such as uh, Predpol are used by the uh, Swiss police force or will they be used by the Swiss police force? So, you know, uh, back to the previous question about the connected objects. Uh, and I think, you know, the more it will be connected, uh, the more we'll be using uh, these uh, objects, you know, uh, uh, for uh, ent ent entertainment uh, objectives. I mean, you know, of course, it facilitates things and we like, you know, the fun side of these uh, technologies and they're sold uh, with us, you know, through uh, excellently done marketing. And if it's used by the uh, uh, American uh, police, if you years ago, uh, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, they may very well be used by the uh, uh, Swiss uh, police. I mean, this market of uh, uh, pr pr predictive uh, uh, systems, uh, I'm sure there are buyers. I mean, uh, what are the discussions amongst the specialists as regarding the transparency that uh, should be required? Uh, uh, should there be an obligation for, for the uh, police uh, if, who use uh, this type of technology to uh, actually ensure a certain amount of transparency? I think we've been very passive, and I don't think we're aware of you know the uh, the hidden life of the data we provide. I mean, in many automated services, we don't know if it's the algorithm who takes the decision or ourselves. And there are initiatives, uh, uh, parliamentary ones uh, in France, that are asking for the transparency of algorithms and also you know the uh, verification of the decisions taken by the algorithm. So you know there's currents of thought emerging, and we saw this in Europe. You know, a clear. There's also actually uh, people want uh, more uh, pr protection, and uh, so there are, uh, there's a legal uh, framework that's helping to move ahead uh, slowly but surely on these issues. Flynn, uh, points of view. Uh, there is an optimistic view that says this is going to help us solve cancer and uh, social problems of uh, uh, incredible scale, things that we have never been able to solve so far. And there is a pessimistic view, which is you know, the, the Terminator version, or uh, Stephen Hawking, who died uh, earlier this, this week, saying that AI may mean the end of the human race. I know you side on the optimist side of the line, so why? Why optimist? Well, I think that there's many answers to that question. The first is that we can't afford not to be. Um, I think it was Helen Keller who said, you know, no pessimist discovered the secret of the stars 
or sailed to an uncharted land or opened up a new doorway to the human spirit. So I think that there's a lot of talk, again, of this very binary, it's going to save us all or it's going to kill us all, Terminator style type thinking. And both of those are scenarios that could happen. I think that the more realistic one is that it's these insidious kind of in-between gray areas that are either going to increase inequality in a major way or help us close that gap and increase access. So I'm optimistic because, you know, as people that focus on human rights, as a human rights lawyer, I've seen the worst in humanity as working in genocide and war crimes. I've also seen the best of humanity in our resilience and in our courage. So I'm an optimist because even if we fail, and individually we all will to some extent, we can strive and we can push a little bit further and maybe we can help one person. So it's not really avoiding you know, the inevitable failure, or the inevitable end that all of us face, but it's that striving anyway. Okay. Then I'm going to ask Solange uh, about uh, her version <laughs> of that. I'm quite sure that she's actually a bit on the other side. But first, give us a couple of examples of AI for good. Yeah, so because that, of real examples. Of course. So it's, again, it's a great question. Technology as a tool can be used you know, for good or for bad. Um, AI for good, some concrete examples um, already are happening in the medical field, for example. So we talked about big data. Um, and you know, detecting things like cancer is something that usually would require a human to go through many, many journals, many, many sets of um, data. And it's not really possible um, for humans to do. So for example, um, there's been some collaborations with labs and radiology to be able to sort through all these journals, all of the scans, so that we can more quickly come to a determination to be able to save a patient's life. Um, there's also this idea of inclusion, so people with certain types of impairments. One of my best friends in the world is a disability rights activist, and she's always talking about this idea of universal inclusion, this inclusion revolution. So can we find tools for people that have a visual impairment, for example? These are people that could you know, be helped if we have things like self-driving cars. We have things that are enabling people not to change, but to make the world more inclusive. So these are some of the examples. There's drones, for example, that are being used um, in Rwanda now to deliver blood to remote parts of the country. So the technology exists and someone's going to use it. So we need to make sure that you know, we're all in that fight. Solange, est-ce que vous partagez l'optimisme de Flynn? Solange, I mean, do you share Flynn's optimism? Yes, no. I mean, it's, it, again, we're not talking about, uh, I think the question not about how the technology is going to be used, but rather how it's going to transform ourselves, our way, how we behave as human um, beings to be good towards others. And uh, we're talking about conditioning and the technology that uh, condition us in a pervasive and sometimes perverse manner. And this is a definite problem. And in the same way that you can have, you know, mistakes in the uh, the way the, way the uh, systems are designed, and the same goes for health. The problem is that we don't yet have the means to uh, monitor the code when it's programmed. It is mentioned in the film. You know, the engineer doesn't have an overall vision of what it is he or she is doing. And you know, again, it's you know the problem is that it's uh, the, the work is done layer by layer by layer, and the, the person the person who actually pushes uh, the button on the uh, gas chamber doesn't know uh, actually what he's doing because everything is actually cut down. And so we don't know how to control the code when it's produced, and we don't know how to control it when it is processed by the processor. And we're so recently, you know, that there were definite uh, problems and uh, also, t the, you know, taking control of the process uh, at a distance uh, raises uh, issues and issues of security and control quality of the product and the one who is going to control legally or illegally this whole chain of production and the whole uh, life cycle of these algorithms and the, the use, I mean, is, 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 is impossible. I mean, you know, there can be abusive use and uh, criminal terrorist use of these uh, technologies. and. Uh, so this is so I mean okay so we, we would like to think that is uh, consistent uh, as you would think uh, of a, a human brain I mean you know there's weaknesses and strengths but a certain level of consistency is what we would hope for so, so where we expect a certain type of behavior so what you're saying is that in reality what we're doing is to uh, uh, set up a system that is getting more and more complex less and less transparent and uh, less and less controllable and that has a, a lot of defects and uh, and uh, we'll have to invent a new technology to control it and we'll have a tendency to actually trust a new technology uh, to, than a, a hu human control and you know I mean you know again we're, we're uh, you know we're, 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 we're going straight straight in, in, in the wall and uh, in the film we saw the use of uh, technology to uh, uh, to uh, carry out uh, uh, predictive uh, policing and uh, to uh, control the uh, social unrest or uh, 
and to also reduce freedom of expression or to um, uh, facilitate repression. I and mean, we're not very far from that. And when you talked about DNA, uh, we realize that you know, the human body and is actually an information system. And perhaps you know, we, we are an information system before the technology or the, or the terminology was invited, invented. And we're in a context where we're able to actually capture the information that we are, uh, you know, uh, a living being, but we are actually industrializing uh, living beings, and we consider you know all the different data about our living being is used uh, as uh, uh, co uh, pie pieces of things that could be um, marketed and uh, put for s on sale. And the problem is that we're considering the human being as an object that can be improved and to put us into little pigeonholes and predetermined by algorithm. Uh, Lorna. Clear to me, and it is that the advances of uh, AI, if you want to safeguard our humanity in the face of AI need to somehow be built around human rights, essentially. How we need to infuse some principles of right and wrong and, and, uh, and values to, uh, to, uh, into, into uh, machines. So human rights as a core design principle for AI? Um, I, I think so. I think it's really important that we think about how our existing international human rights framework um, applies to this space. We're in Geneva, um, the heart of the UN human rights system, and I think that it's really important that we think about what we have already achieved and how it will apply in this space. And I think the important thing when we think about opportunities and risks um, is that AI is here, technology is here, big data is here, it's a reality and it is going at a really fast pace. Um, and we have to think in the human rights world um, about how we can benefit um, from this reality, um, whether we think it's right or wrong, it's happening. So how can it advance human rights, as Flynn's talking about? But even when we're thinking about how it can advance human rights, we have to think about how to ensure that r there are not human rights risks at the same time. Um, so we don't want to get into the situation where we say um, big data AI can help us better document human rights violations or it can help us respond to disaster or humanitarian crisis better. But in doing so, there are certain rights that will be violated. So we always have to make sure that the human rights um, framework underpins opportunities as well as risks. Um, but I think this film really highlights the big risks that we need to urgently respond to. Um, the criminal justice system is a really sharp end example of how predictive technology um, can present huge risks. So when we see something about pre-crime before someone has even committed a crime, um, that really turns on its head the idea of innocent until proven guilty because someone hasn't even done anything yet and yet they have a criminal justice intervention. Um, we see the real risk of discrimination in this film and the targeting of communities that are already over-policed in many instances. Um, and how these technologies can feed into existing practices in real life and may um, give consequence and result to issues on the right to liberty. Um, so I think this film is, you know, a one good example among another, uh, f a number of other examples in the criminal justice system, in immigration systems, where we have to be really concerned about the use of technology in AI. And so I think we need to be not just thinking about how do we manage what's already happening and what may come, mm. but we need to really fundamentally think about what is the society we want to live in and what is the place of technology, what is the place of AI, and what are we prepared to let develop and where are the red lines where we say, sorry, this is not a space where we're prepared to let this enter? The discussion doesn't seem to be happening almost anywhere at a social level. It's happening among specialists and experts. It's happening in some small quarters. But uh, uh, I have the impression that everybody here assumes that there is no slowdown of the technology possible. And uh, my assumption is the reason because especially of the competition between the two big actors of this technology which are Silicon Valley run by corporations and China run by the government and each one wants to get there first wants to get there so soon AI as a super intelligence first uh, so there is no way of kind of slowing down and trying to figure out first the moral and ethical implications etc etc am I thinking right or well I think um there's often an interest in saying it's anti-innovation to talk about regulation, to talk about ethics, to talk about human rights. 
Um, but I think we have to. I think um, we absolutely have to set the, the framework now um, before it's too late. I think there is a nice line in the movie, if I can find it, where someone, um, I forgot who, said, before dystopian reality, um, when things can be done about it. Yeah. And I think that's the moment we're in now, where we have to think about this is the reality, how can we benefit it from it while dealing with the risks? And where are these red lines where we just say, this is not where, as a society, we're prepared to go? Flynn, uh, you're writing a book about this very issue, how to inject values into machines, right? Now, values are something that are difficult to define and describe. They're even more difficult to agree upon, and certainly very difficult to put into software. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, um, I think that, you know, ultimately, as we'll see in this field, is that there's so many more questions than answers. So let's say we all even agree that we should infuse ethics and values into machines. Okay, great, which ones do we choose? Isaiah Berlin talks about this concept of values pluralism. So is it even possible to choose and how to kind of make a hierarchy of these values? So, of course, there are no easy answers to those questions. And in fact, we debate these questions in human rights all the time. And we're debating them across, you know, um, cultures, across spaces, you know, equality versus freedom in the U.S. I mean, there are so many different ways that we could come to a dead end. I think that the only thing that I've understood for sure is that we need to be asking these questions and there need to be more people at the table of diverse viewpoints, demographics, and ideas so that we can be having this debate. The most dangerous thing happening in this field right now is we're making it, we don't know quite sure how it works, but trust us, we're really trying to help the world here. And that's where this idea of regulation and of course all the dangers come into play. So we need to be having these discussions and we need to be understanding that we're moving towards an idea of inputting these systems into a place. So for example, one of the greatest lines I thought in the film was this idea of code not having a conscience. And part of the reason this is so challenging is because well, what, what does intelligence mean? What does consciousness even mean? So part of why this is holding up a mirror to us so much is because our very space in the food chain is being threatened. And if we can't figure these ideas out for ourselves, how do we end wars in general? How do we figure out you know, which values to use? Of course, it's gonna be difficult, but it's in that journey, in that willingness to come together at the table and to pull out a chair for someone else of a different demographic that we can get more examples. I'll just give one really quick example to make it concrete. So I was on a panel about diversifying the future of emerging technology and AI. And um, for example, you know you're, when you put your hand under the faucet for the water to come down, right, in, the, in, in a bathroom? That is cued to light skin. So if someone of color is not involved in the discussion, the faucet is not gonna work. So we can't solve our problems, but we can say we need to have diverse viewpoints, men, women, people of color, people from different places to come together. Because that is an answer that's intractable. I, for example, just me, this is my life's work, I wouldn't be able to solve that. It's only by opening the doors and giving access and agency to people that they can help us make these choices. Same with human rights. We don't save anybody, but we can give people opportunity and agency and access to help themselves. Uh, Solange, vous parlez de la question des biais que Lynn vient de, vient de soulever. Uh, Jusqu'ici... Solange, artificial intelligence has been uh, showing pretty good uh, results on different issues like uh, getting you uh, from point A to point B or choosing uh, uh, um, um, a game you play. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when it comes to political issues and social, more complex uh, issues, uh, the results are, are far less satisfactory. Some software have become uh, racist uh, within a few hours of being launched on the, uh, on the net. Some research uh, has uh, shown that uh, some uh, other software uh, give the priority to uh, fake news or racist news. Yes, there are, uh, for me, problems even uh, when you trust entirely a system to bring you from point A to B. Uh, you will end up uh, uh, losing the uh, potential, uh, um, your capacity uh, to uh, uh, find your way through a city and you're going to lose uh, the capacity to know exactly what you want because the machine is going to suggest something even before you actually can think about what you really want. 
And uh, uh, you trust a system that is not perfect and that can be vulnerable. So for me, there are different levels of influence uh, for this system on our lives. I also enjoy, uh, for example, getting lost in a city myself. So we need to think about all these uh, consequences and not only think in terms of performances. You see here that you uh, score people, you quantify people, you quantify everything. Of course, you do that uh, uh, at school or in your, in your company, but that, for me, is a problem. You can't um, score everything, you can't quantify everything. Coming back to, uh, for example, fake news and uh, robots uh, generating um, dialogue uh, that uh, give you uh, the uh, answers you want to listen, you want to have. This is, in fact, uh, manipulating opinions. And this is a real problem, and we can uh, see that happening already, manipulation uh, even of uh, democratic expression. Uh, manipulation of leaders, whether they are political leaders or economic leaders. For me, uh, the big question is whether the information we see is right, whether the platform is uh, on which we uh, find the information is uh, true. It's difficult to tell. And that is very disturbing. We tend to believe uh, when it comes to uh, numbers, but we see that uh, tweets can be retweeted God knows how many times, and that does not prove any, any truth. Uh, so uh, the, the problem is to find the uh, authenticity. Because it's a straightforward way of thinking that we should try to find a way to infuse rights into machines, to, to use principles of human rights uh, to, to, to train and to uh, shape the machines. But I'm wondering whether the opposite is also true, whether the arrival of AI and similar technologies in our society are going to force us or push us towards a redefinition of rights, a redefinition of what's good and what's right and wrong, for example. In what, in what way are you thinking? Uh, I don't know, but suddenly, if algorithms start taking decisions for us, uh, then will those decisions over time kind of lead in a direction when somehow we start redefining what's right? Because, well, suddenly we find ourselves here rather than here, and you know, society changes without us really deciding it. Well. I, and I wonder whether that happens though with people as as well when we're thinking about decision makers. And I think that that's what the the framework that we have already, the human rights that we have already, that's what they're there for. They're they're universally agreed upon principles um, that states have come together and agreed about and and looked at how they apply in the world. And I think that that's what they're there for to ensure that certain harm doesn't occur. And I think that that's what's a bit worrying in this space, that when we don't go to international human rights, where, which are you know, universally agreed sets of harm, then we start getting locally designed, locally agreed upon values. And, and like Flynn's talking about, then that becomes dependent on who the designers are of the algorithms, who it is that's creating these codes in the first place, and then the decisions will result from that very beginning point. So, you know, I feel, and, and in our research, we feel very strongly that we have clear definitions of harm that are internationally agreed upon, and we apply them to humans, human decision makers, so why wouldn't they be applied to algorithms and to AI? Um, there can be a tendency that just because it's technology, we think that the frameworks that we already have are not fit for purpose. I think they are fit for, for, for fit for purpose, but we have to take them into new spaces. So that does mean we're wor working with um, people who are designing code. Um, it does mean that we have to work with people that may not be as accustomed to working with international human rights, and we may not be as accustomed as working with them. So it's new dialogues and new applications, but not new rights. 
So you uh, co-directed this project called Human Rights, Big Data, and Technology. It involves a couple dozen researchers across many different fields, uh, including social science, not only computer science, anthropology, and, uh, and, and so. And one of the things you do is really to try to identify big risks and suggest ways of kind of regulating them. And now, when we think of, as you've seen also in the discussion, when we think of risks of technology, generally the first one we all think about is privacy, and the second one is privacy. Uh, and, 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 and we rarely move beyond that. Uh, so, so there isn't only privacy, no? No, um, you know, as I said before, um, technology, be data, AI, they affect all human rights. All human rights are at risk. Um, and they have very real, tangible outcomes. It can be that someone ends up being tortured you know, in prison. But I think we shouldn't discount privacy. Privacy um, you know, is a really key and important right, and it has a hu huge implications here because of the way in which technology works. And that can really have a big impact on how people self-identify, you know, how they operate and live in the world, their freedom of expression, what they're prepared to say, um, what they're prepared to say in their own homes, um, you know, because of the Internet of Things. So privacy is really key in and of itself, but it's also um, a gateway that once privacy is interfered with, all other rights um, are up for grabs, yep. really, in a way that's much more profound than before when you had to get a judicial warrant to go into someone's house and search it. Um, you know, with so, technologies that can, you know, listen in, in order to play music, for example, you know, we're seeing, um, we're seeing prosecutorial authorities trying to get that information and the recordings from that. Exactly. So um, 30 million Alexa devices have been sold in the United States. 30 million, which is one every 10 Americans, essentially. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows what Alexa is, but it's a device for Amazon that you put on your table and listens to what is said in your house. And if one of the sentences starts with Alexa, it kind of turns on and listens to the command. Alexa, what's the weather like today in New York? And Alexa would answer in voice. But in order to be always on, to be able to answer that, uh, it needs to be listening environmentally to what is said in the house. And that figure mesmerizes me. 30 million devices in America only, which means that there are 30 million households that have a listening device alive 24 hours a day in their home. Does this surprise you at all? Any of you? You know, the, the question I'd like to ask is, you know, whether uh, the right to disconnection, is it con to be considered as a fundamental human right, the right to disconnect? I mean, uh, you, you will have noticed, you know, all human rights uh, you know, are actually uh, at risk uh, with uh, the evolution of technologies, you know, whatever the uh, primary objectives. I mean, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, shouldn't we actually, you know, reconsider the very uh, foundation of uh, human rights and to consider the right to disconnect, the right to not have a, a Facebook account, the right to not have a Twitter account, the, and the right to uh, disconnect uh, without, uh, you know, becoming a criminal and uh, without being a, uh, uh, put in a little box uh, where it'll be written criminal. Yeah. Should we add a right to be disconnected to human rights? Well, I think a, a connected point is the idea that it's the individual that should be carrying the burden here. You know, the individual shouldn't buy certain devices, um, should, and also that the individual should really understand how they work and what R the implications are. Right now, are. Most, of, most of the burden is actually carried by individuals, right, in terms of flag uh, inappropriate content or make sure that your phone is off or this kind mm -hmm. of things. But I think that the, the question of what have you actually consented to and to what extent could you pick that up? What are the options in which you can turn off, turn on um, devices? The, you know, that's all really underdeveloped. And I think that people are still not even able to imagine what engaging with these um, devices might actually be able to do. Um, you know, the question, do they record, do they not record? I don't think that enters people's minds when they're buying these. They're thinking, this just sounds like a really convenient thing, way to order my groceries. And they don't imagine that the potential, that the data that comes from there can be um, taken together and combined with loads of other seemingly innocuous pieces of data to build a picture about you that is or isn't right, um, is or isn't accurate. And then the really crucial question, which I think connects with this um, idea of disconnect or what 
what control you have is what can you do about it and that came out in the film as well you know if a picture is built of you one how do you find out that that picture has been built about you how do you know about which company sold your information or which company gave your information to a state because they were legally required to how do you find out where those pictures are and how do you challenge them like in the film how do you get off a list if you're on a list all of that really underexplored, but really crucial to people's lives. Yeah. Somebody the other day uh, in another panel said something like, uh, we need to imagine that, that picture as a picture of us naked, and a real picture of us naked, and that's what's out there. Uh, so we've used more than half an hour already, and uh, before we continue here, I would like to see whether anyone in the room has any question. We have microphones around, so we're gonna start with the lady here. Can we get some lights up so we can see the audience and figure out who is raising a hand. Yes, you, uh, here, please. Hello, um, and thanks for this really interesting discussion. I'm finding it even more interesting than the film. I have two questions, I think um, mostly for you, but perhaps um, for the others as well. The first question, I think, more than the question of privacy, what I'm preoccupied with is the question of regulation. So may maybe my question is around regulation. Um, you said s something about needing to regulate earlier, and so my first question is simply, what would you regulate? You know, if you if you if you could you know, make recommendations to governments now on you know three areas, you know, what would you regulate? Um, and related to that, my concern I think is um, regard you know the economy is the service economy, which is basically well, to a large extent, data flowing around all over the place. And it seems to me, and the idea of human rights is in a sense, or was originally protecting individuals from abuses of the state. And it seems to me that this, now the economy is so based on data that goes beyond you know, the capacity of any individual or, or entity to understand. Does, yeah, maybe that would be my question about has that fundamentally changed you know, what human rights can do and how human rights intervenes because, you know, for good or for bad, the, this, you know, the scale of it and the complexity of it is so large, how does one even, yeah, consider regulating it or, or you know, for, for societal good? Um, fantastic question and one that preoccupies um, me and um, our team. Um, every day. Um, I think that there's, here in Geneva, there's a lot that can be done and is being done um, within UN agencies to look at what the response um, needs to be in the Human Rights Council being really important, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, other key agencies um, within the UN space. Um, so there's, there's big questions about the, how the human rights frameworks and other frameworks apply, but there's also um, sectoral approaches. So to take one example concretely, um, if we think about what we saw in the film, if we also think about how risk assessments are currently being used, um, using algorithms um, to decide whether or not someone should be granted bail, should be released from prison um, based on the likelihood that they may commit a crime again. And, and the same type of, of data being pooled in, some about the person particularly, and um, some general information, some of which there's a risk that it can be a proxy for race, for example, if we look at someone's neighborhood. Um, and a lot of the discussion right now is about, well, as long as there's a human in the loop that can intervene, um, and as long as that um, risk assessment is not um, the only reason that a bail decision is reached, then that's good. Um, my pushback on that would be, well, how, how well equipped and how effective is a human going to be and how ready is a human going to be to challenge a risk assessment that's produced by an algorithm that they don't understand. So I think right now if I could see one area where we we're really looking at regulation it would be in the criminal justice space to say where can we be using these types of technologies at all and when we think we can use them, what is the really strong oversight and safeguards in place so that we're not seeing human rights violations um, and human rights being at risk from things like discrimination. So that would be a really concrete sector area, but I think there's lots of sectors. And as your question also um, pointed to, um, the question of companies holding all this data, you know, I think that is a really important area where we need to 
to look at how human rights gets into that space and how it regulates the sharing of data between companies, um, between companies and states, um, and then between states and states, um, because the, that data can keep, can keep going and being processed by um, different technologies along the way. So, so it's a huge area because it impacts every part of life, but I think that we can start to, to break it down um, and, and have you know, effective um, interventions in particular areas. Uh, Flynn Solange, this question of the black boxes. I mean, machine learning systems, without getting technical, but machine learning systems essentially, uh, essentially use so-called neural networks, which are kind of layers upon layers upon layers of data treatment. And uh, in data go and out comes an assessment or a prediction. And even the designers at this point don't really understand how that happened and why that prediction gets there, because those layers kind of self teach themselves, self-learn, and therefore they change all the time. So how do we solve this issue of the black box? Because yes, human in the loop means somebody is overseeing, but if that somebody doesn't know what happens in the black box, then there is no way to oversee. Mais peut-être une façon d'aborder le problème, c'est one way of looking at the problem is to uh, ask ourselves the question about, uh, you know, where where do human rights, where are human rights as of the uh, c collection of data? I mean, when we agree to give uh, data on uh, social media, or when you uh, uh, put a request in a Google engine, what we don't know about is the metadata that's being uh, harvested at the same time. I think we need to have the technical equipment so when the user connects or uses a given service, he or she should be able within the way he, uh, the parameters of his uh, uh, request, you know, in, a, in the life cycle, two, three, five seconds, after that, uh, the information should be destroyed and, 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 and to give sort of uh, caps of invisibility and to uh, make people, uh, uh, make them understand, you know, the metadata that are being uh, harvested and what we give is 20% uh, of our data and uh, what's destroyed is 80%. That's huge. And we should stop, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, algorithm treatment and uh, um, uh, in, in inducement, and I think we should uh, we should look at the problem as from the origin, and uh, this will contribute to, to uh, somewhat uh, uh, limit uh, the uh, collection of data. And we saw people who were constantly uh, connected. Perhaps ask ourselves, you know, about uh, how to use a service. Are we uh, uh, agreed to be constantly, uh, you know, uh, as if uh, you know uh, information was being collected from us uh, uh, night and day? And considering the negative uh, uh, potential and impact of the technology, it's not the technology that's bad, it's the entities uh, who produce them who are going to uh, find their interest, economic interest in it, and all the uh, criminal uh, entities who will uh, find the way to actually uh, to, uh, gain uh, profit from the power of uh, these uh, technologies. Kind of the th one of the themes that's come out of what these incredible panelists have been saying is that, you know, th especially with what's happening now, is there's this concept of like, no, we're building this stuff, don't worry, we don't know quite how it works, no one really does, but we're cool, we're going to help you, so don't worry. And the idea is access at the very beginning is that we can all be part of this conversation. And I think that that's so much of what happens is that it stays siloed with a very specific demographic. And they say, we're building it. You, you don't really understand. You couldn't possibly understand. And we can all be a part of this conversation. We can all be a part of understanding. Just like, so we're the, we're, we're the, um, we're the hero of our own story as opposed to just being an object. And we can all be part of this discussion, but there's very much a wall. Yes, indeed, there is a big asymmetry between users who give away all their data and don't appear anywhere. And on the other hand, uh, these companies uh, which uh, apply no transparency whatsoever on the algorithms uh, they're using. And I believe that regulation uh, could be a solution to impose uh, to companies, whether they are big multinational companies or startups, uh, to explain how they are dealing with data. Question. Any other questions in the room? Merci. J'ai une question complète. Yes, I have a, a very naive uh, question. What is the situation in Europe? Uh, how uh, are people aware, really, of these uh, problems? I could, for example, ask uh, Solange how they deal with the fact that many political leaders are completely ignorant and uh, know absolutely nothing about these issues, whereas uh, she, for example, is uh, um, very much uh, 
Uh, where? I don't know. I mean, our political leaders seem to be very uh, useless. Do they uh, want to do anything? Are they aware at all? We've got uh, geniuses in Switzerland. We've got uh, excellent mathematicians. And why, why on earth is Switzerland so ridiculous in that field? Well, what I see is that uh, there is a different uh, degree of awareness, uh, and especially uh, what uh, is uh, at play here are lobbies. I think uh, uh, one of the uh, political leaders you were mentioning, Mr. Parlela, is one of the very few who understands uh, the issues. But I uh, strongly believe that the uh, weight uh, of the political uh, economy and uh, people uh, keep thinking that uh, economy and growth uh, are uh, an end in itself. And I think that uh, they uh, don't really uh, understand the power of these technologies. People see all the opportunities but don't see the impact. And even for us as uh, simple users, uh, it's uh, fun. So it's uh, an immediate uh, reward when you use this technology. So uh, maybe political leaders uh, did not um, realize the, the problem immediately. And I must say that even lawyers, a few, or judges, uh, uh, a few years back, uh, did not really understand uh, the link between cyber criminality and reality. So there, there is. Uh, we have taken uh, some time, and uh, this uh, is um, prejudice. Uh, is uh, damage, uh, damageable. Yes, you were mentioning uh, the situation in Europe as well. Within two months. Uh, a, a new uh, um, EU legislation on data protection is coming into force. What is going to change for us as users? Well, it puts uh, the responsibility on uh, companies to protect data and personal data. So it is, uh, in a way, uh, imposing uh, um, certain rules on uh, American uh, big data companies. So for us in Europe, the idea, the notion of privacy in uh, the field of data and the capacity to go freely on the internet is important. So they have to provide services to protect this da these data. So they will now have to behave uh, differently. And uh, we can uh, hit them when, where it most hurts uh, uh, financially. But this uh, new European uh, regulation uh, is uh, going to is not going to hit uh, other types of companies. Yes. Uh, any other questions in the room? I'd like to see if there's somebody up there as well. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to raise the issue uh, of medicalization of uh, social science research uh, systems we have found in the uh, neoliberal society, mostly in that film. And I'd like to compare it uh, to the public health issue and the world situation in public health. And I do think that uh, uh, in health and in ethical issues and in human rights issues, they come very, very closely. I would like to give you an example. Example, the last uh, UN General Assembly has changed totally the view of the world in public health. And WHO and the UN has decided that no more infectious diseases, infectious diseases, that, uh, and the comparison would be uh, somebody or bacteria do something, possibly something bad, but that everybody has bad lifestyles. And what we use in public health is Gauss curves, and we never have a very good prediction for individuals, what they do. But if you, have a, if you are a diabetic, uh, a targeted person because you are genetic like this, well, you're likely to get it. But the likeliness remains a likeliness. Now, my question simply is that in this debate, 
seems to be, the way you have discussed it, is so far away from the public health uh, discussion uh, 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 platform on which this is discussed, and from the world, and the Western world, is totally accepted and acceptable. And we have uh, very clear uh, uh, standards to be used. We know much more, I agree to this, and I do not want to compare the, uh, the medical authorities to the police authorities. But the so, question is, is uh, 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 yeah. what is the big difference to this? And I would like to have clarification. So let me, let me, let me, let me try to translate the question, because there is, a health, there is a dataization of healthcare, in a way. And health data seem to be probably one of the top three uh, uh, issues and targets of interest. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made if we can put this kind of technology into healthcare. Uh, the gentleman seems to, 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 to think that the practices that already exist probably need to be replicated into the system. But what's your assessment of that? Yes, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, uh, on, in April, uh, in Geneva, there'll be an e-health uh, conference, and next week, uh, a digital health uh, conference is going to take place in Geneva as well. So, uh, the international community is indeed uh, preoccupied and concerned with these issues. Flynn? It's a space where the debate we had before about huge opportunities versus huge risks come exactly into the center, right? Uh, Everybody is looking at AI to help you know, speed up research about things like cancer and others, or monitor epidemics, as the gentleman was mm -hmm. saying. At the same time, uh, possibly some of the most precious data are the ones that have to do with our individual health. So how do we square that? I think that these are some of the greatest questions, also because these are some of the advancements that are starting to happen right now in AI. And again, the same tool that can be used to help someone who has been ill or has an impairment can also help increase inequality depending on who has access to this tool. So I think that these are some of the most pressing questions because you know, once the genie is out of the bottle, it's never going to be going back in. So I think that these are some of the things that touch people the closest. And again, it could go either way. But the answer is that the technology is here. So how can we use it? And what I really like about what you're speaking about is this idea of public access and public health as opposed to a very real scenario of a very specific small set of people controlling all the data and using it for their good and, and increasing the inequality into who has access to these systems. So that it's, it's similar to advertising. They've always used behavioral science to get people to buy things. That's not going away. But because of that, if you get people in human rights or on other sides of the debate into it, then again, we can be in the fight. So I think these are really important questions because, again, health in terms of AI is really still very, very small group of startup companies in, t in Silicon Valley, for example. But we need to be thinking about public access. And it's a very complicated question. Just, you know, for example, um, to use AI in creativity. Some people say, well, it's taking away an artist's ability to make a painting if an AI can do it. Yes, that's the case. But on the other side of things, if we partner with these tools and work in collaboration with them, it can lift our creativity to new heights. It can kind of free humans to be more creative. And it can free, for example, a doctor to spend more time with an actual patient if they're getting some help sifting through the data. I've, I've heard that story many times. And, uh, and I agree on one level and disagree on the other. And here is why. Uh, and, and, then, and then we bring him with the question of jobs because it's the big elephant in the room, right? Mm -hmm. People are very concerned about AI, robots, anything like that coming in and taking jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason why I, I, I have a part of me that agrees and part of me that disagrees is uh, if the technology frees up more time for, pay, for doctors to spend with patients, the question is who is going to pay the doctor to spend the time with the patients? Because if we had that money, we would spend it today. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so is it, it going to give more time to the doctor, or is it just going to diminish the number of doctors? Mm -hmm. Well, these are the questions. This is why things like regulation are, is so important. And I love what Lorna said, too, about this is touching every space. So it's not actually just about one big regulation. Actually, every sector is going to need to have answers to these questions. So again, either route is completely possible and any number of routes in between. So the answer keeps coming back to we need more people in the room that have ideas like public health or human rights on their mind. You know, when you're talking about ethics, there's so many discussions of ethics in AI, and I'm saying, 
Wh where is the ethicist? I don't see an ethicist in the room. I don't see someone focused on public, he public health in the room. So there's no one answer other than we need someone that's going to say, you know, I like that idea, but have you thought about this? Because we can't possibly all have the answers. Anyone that says, I alone can fix it, that's a red flag. Yeah. So we need to be able to have more people in the room to say, hey, but have you thought of this? But have you thought of this? Laura, this question of, of work and jobs, uh, there is, this is a report from Yes. What has become world legendary uh, about 47% of all professions being at risk because of AI. And then dozens of other reports somehow going in the same direction. And then there is a whole other school of thought that says it's not the case because AI is just going to you know, take over the routine jobs and therefore we're going to be left with the more creative jobs, which is a pretty cool situation to be. So where, where, where do, we, do you sit in that debate? Um, well, it's a complex one. Um, I think that, you know, on the one hand, we've always seen this debate when we have a technological revolution that there are going to be jobs lost and there's usually been the response that, well, these um, jobs will be replaced by technology, but that this new technological revolution will create a new wave of jobs. I think what's different here, particularly with AI um, and the extent to which AI can become and, and assume certain human functions in the way that older technology didn't. Um, I think what's different is it's not absolutely clear that new um, ways of living will create new jobs. I think what's also different is that it, set, it's go it looks like it's going to affect all levels. Um, so it's not just um, certain types of jobs that are going to become automated. Um, and I think that what's good about that is it's woken people up to the question about this. Um, then there's the bigger debate about, well, what if large parts of the population don't have jobs anymore? Um, is that actually what we want? Do we really want um, you know, large people, even if there is some kind of um, payment to their yeah, so universal basic live, income you know, so we had a debate and, yesterday night about and, that yeah, just and so here we come downstairs. right back to what you know what are the what's the point of how being do we design human society? And, and how do we want to live and and just because we can do it do we have to do it and i think that your your question about the doctor is a really key one because um it's not just about the economic value and and um and efficiency of these technologies, but if we're going to employ them, then we have to have a clear debate about, well, are we employing them in order to give the doctor more time, for example, yeah. or in order to do something? Mm -hmm. That's within our control right now. That's within our gift. Yeah, for now it still is. But um, we sometimes just get um, carried away with, well, the technology can do it all, so therefore yeah. we just have to follow the technology. Actually, we're completely in control. And that's where, just to connect to another debate, I get really worried when people talk about, well, if the, if the technology does it, then who's responsible? Who's responsible? The people that decided to employ the technology. Humans are still there. <laughs> that's actually know? one of the big challenges, but uh, we open up a whole new field yeah. there. So let's go and take another question. There's a question here, uh, the lady, and then we go up there, and then we come down for more. Uh, bonsoir. Yes, good evening. So I, I, I'd like to thank uh, 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 Professor uh, uh, Gernauti, uh, I think it's good to uh, remain uh, somewhat uh, uh, sceptical. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, as a, uh, a lawyer, I have two questions. I do agree uh, that there are uh, topics that we need to uh, uh, think about, uh, and um, and in many many fields where uh, uh, AI may be used. But I mean, there are two things that I uh, actually am very concerned about, and uh, you know, that are uh, uh, in our everyday life, and we're going to have to uh, deal with. The first of these questions is, I mean, w I mean, what we're doing is judging people who haven't yet committed a crime. So what it means is that, you know, so so on the road to uh, criminality, uh, the person hasn't yet committed anything. And so, uh, in fact, uh, it's just the intention that's a criminal. And that, you know, is a huge ethical uh, uh, problem for me. And and uh, I think that we really have to ask ourselves the, 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 the question, I mean, can we punish someone who has not yet committed something or done something, who has perhaps has the intention, uh, or who I just thought about it, or, or, or you, know, you know, it's like, you know, oh, God, I could kill my neighbor when, you know, he's making noise at 2 in the morning. But uh, and it's co-presented by the uh, humanitarian uh, 
Law Institute, and there's a problem. You said, you know, that there are drones, uh, you know, that can actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, provide blood, and but there are drones that kill as well. I mean, you know, we have uh, autonomous weapons, and uh, I find this very scary. And you were talking about responsibility. That's exactly what we're talking about. You know, who is behind all of this? So when will we be able to have uh, justice when there's crimes against humanity? You know, who, who are we going to say? Who's the person we're going to say? But you are responsible. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, okay. I think you, you will answer your question in the next debate because that's going to be the topic of the next film. Uh, that, that last question, but. Um, so, you know, back to the intention of committing a crime. So what I'd like to say is that, you know, with these mass surveillance uh, technologies, we are all guilty. So by, by default, we're all, uh, we're all um, guilty. I mean, there's a paradigm re reversal. And so this is so important that we're all part of a problem or a solution, and that I think that this idea of what well, you couldn't, you know, you're not even guilty yet. What, how could you possibly, um, you know, be in trouble for something? And it's because the data isn't technically neutral because someone has decided. So it's built in, right? The bias is already built in. So it's the only thing we can do is understand that it's there. That this isn't just, you know, you're not doing image recognition and it's all going to be completely neutral. This is built in because it's built by humans. So eventually, you know, it's starting to understand and learn on its own, and we don't understand where it's going, but it's built by us. So the only really sure thing we can do is say, wait, this is biased. We have to question it. It's an algorithm, so it's fine. You know, that's this idea that, well, the technology did it, so it must be sifting through the data. No, a human created that system. And I, and I love what you said, too, because this has to do with all types of things, from harassment to the future of technologies, that we're all part of the problem and the solution. And we can all do our part, and we all have a role to play. So I think that's really well said. Let's take a question from up there. Was somebody raising uh, their hand? Yes, please. Um, so I had a question, perhaps a bit naive. So the, 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 the principle itself of uh, uh, AI is to create a sort of intelligence that will be uh, exterior, external to human beings. What it means is that before we've uh, reached singularity, singularity is when we reach the level of uh, human's intelligence or you go beyond it. So finally, uh, the, the, the principle behind uh, uh, AI, AI, isn't it dangerous? Because uh, we're, we're no longer in, in control of everything that's happening. And uh, surely we can uh, uh, encode uh, uh, systems in the way that uh, suits us at the very beginning. Uh, how can we know that considering that uh, uh, AI it regenerates itself. So at the end of the day, in any case, we will no longer be in control of what is going to happen. Is the sentence in the mood? Why are we pushing this technology on ourselves? Why are we pushing this technology on ourselves? I think that that's such a great question because it goes to this idea of what it means to be human and to be moving forward and to, you know, to disrupt and to innovate and to create new things. I think that you know one of the things that, one of the only things that sets apart humans from other species are, is our ability to cooperate in big numbers. And I think, I, I love kind of the door that you opened because you know, what I think about all the time is well, you know, what does intelligence mean? And what does it mean to be conscious and to be alive? And I think that what can really help and what AI can really do is hold up a mirror to say, what are we so wrapped up in that we need to make sure that human intelligence is the only intelligence that matters? And um, what are we so afraid of with AI? And it's that we would no longer be at the top of the food chain. But the truth is that an octopus has a certain type of intelligence. All different, you know, nature has a certain different type of intelligence. And if we can open to do the door to that, we'll be a lot less afraid because we don't have to be special to matter. And I think it's really, really a great question because we can't solve these other questions if we haven't figured out what our own intelligence means. And I think that's why it's redefining these questions. And it's very scary in a way. The word intelligence is highly ambiguous and difficult to uh, define. But why do we try to do this? Because we're afraid of death. And we try and actually push back uh, the frontiers. And uh, we want to uh, see ourselves as the creators of humanity. And uh, there are uh, individuals who uh, actually you know, uh, have this uh, uh, mindset to, to go beyond the uh, limits of biology and to have this uh, eternal life uh, through uh, systems, through uh, actually an IT code. And there's one word uh, we didn't uh, uh, mention so much, uh, the three slogans of the Silicon Valley. 
It's to transform the data into money. They're very good at doing that, to transform connectivity into power. They're also very good at doing that, and to transform your code into laws and changing paradigm, thinking that the code is right, and to put us in a situation of dependency, submission to the IT code and to the system. What it means is, you know, to the designer of the such systems, I think we should look very closely at the psychology and the motivation of uh, these uh, designers, and perhaps also, you know, on the um, uh, on the the the, part, the share of dream that they're going to give to the engineers, and uh, I think. Um, I think it's a, a utopia of a technology of this uh, dream, not the American dream, the Silicon Valley, the siliconization of the world. And I think it uh, carries in itself uh, hope uh, to uh, actually uh, uh, deal with our human weaknesses. And some of us uh, are 100 percent in agreement with this. And uh, there's a cultural context, a geopolitical context uh, that's quite specific. And it seems to me that uh, you know these uh, you know big uh, corporate leaders. Uh, uh, CEOs, uh, you know, uh, you know, actually, you know, want uh, 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 power, and uh, so, uh, so um, there's an article, a famous uh, article that was written, and uh, so, you know, all uh, uh, codes can will define what we can do or not do uh, on the, the computers and uh, the uh, uh, the digital world. Uh, so it's the uh, equivalent of a uh, uh, legal rule, but. Uh, but not decided by representative entities. This is decided by a group of engineers uh, and a minority of uh, people uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, very specialized. And that's the problem. There's been no uh, debate, a societal debate on these very issues. And uh, yes, absolutely. And that's why sessions at this evening are so important. And there's a gentleman here and madam there. Yeah, uh, keep your hand up so we can see you. And there was someone else here? Uh, no, no. Oh, okay, back here. Yes, so good evening. The, the, the film uh, raises the question, and quite pertinently so, uh, regarding the state and uh, the issues of uh, um, AI. And I wanted to ask a question regarding, you know, the relations between individuals in a same uh, society that are raised. We talked uh, at one point in time of the algorithm that has become race, that becomes racist after a few minutes on Facebook. And, okay, there's a, I mean, okay, it's not the human being that becomes a racist in a few minutes on Facebook. But there's a certain tendency uh, of uh, uh, closing in, uh, closing, and the algorithm gives us what it is we want to see, uh, things that the algorithm thinks we're going to like. So suggestions are made, taking into account what we like. And uh, so instead of AI opening us up to the world, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, in fact, you know, it's it's uh, our own little self that is uh, 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 being uh, uh, pandered to, and it's and uh, it's not a it's not a coincidence. In fact, uh, uh, the fact that the algorithm has become racist, uh, uh, perhaps uh, you know, there's a good reason behind that. So here's my question. So, uh, in relation to the human rights uh, question, isn't there something inherent in these algorithms that uh, goes against a, a intersocietal, inter-individual uh, uh, dialogue that, that uh, would, in fact, uh, uh, do away with human rights? So, I'm sure that's what's being suggested uh, behind the film. Yeah. Lord, uh, sorry, Flynn. Sorry. I think these are the really important questions. Again, we need to ask. You know, as you. As we, we all see every day, you know, when we go on Facebook, we start to see things that validate what we already know. So we have, we have fake news now. We have going on, you know, and saying, oh, we're getting this diverse amount of viewpoints, but it's actually just validating what we already know. And then this question of, you know, when we think about who we relate to each other as a society, and, uh, you know, this question of human rights plus AI is a very complicated one, I think, because. <sighs> I guess, you know, what we need to start thinking about, in my opinion, is expanding this definition because our current definition of machines are here and news is here and human rights are here. It's not really working for us anymore. And our current definition of human rights is difficult because we, and it's not just AI, it's animals, it's the environment, it's how we treat each other, it's what we're seeing in the news. So I think that you bring up this important point and my, you know, my answer is we need to be redefining actually what it means to have human rights, what does it mean to be human and who, who gets to be a part of that. And it's so challenging because you also brought up this amazing point of, well, some things need to be 
fixed so that we can always have like a goalpost, you know, that we can like an axis of values. But the truth is, is that we need to be redefining what it means to be human in our society. And if we're going to be like partnering with machines or if they're going to be part of things, well, what do we do? You know, who, whose fault is it when, when something goes wrong in a self-driving car? And like you said, it's the person that employed that technology. But then is the person that made it liable to that person? So it's coming up right against human rights, but there are answers to be found, I believe. But the answer is that we need someone who's tuned into human rights in that conversation. The person that created that Facebook algorithm is a computer scientist. So by default, that's just not the focus. And I think that there's you know, innovation and disruption. There's a, um, there's a desire to move forward, and then we'll figure out the ethics and the regulations later. And I think what all of us are saying in different ways is it starts from the beginning. We need to have these regulations in place. We need someone in the room that's having that discussion so that when we build these tools, they're not completely at odds. There was a question here. Oui, bonsoir. Good evening. My question is this. Technology is going to evolve more and more quickly, become more and more intelligent, and probably even more intelligent than human beings. And humans will have to find uh, different um, occupations. So my question is, how do you uh, use people, or how, which occupation do you give them for people who maybe do not have the capacity to uh, make, uh, to do uh, very uh, long or very hard studies? Uh, how can uh, you make those people useful? How can states uh, find a way to use the people who um, And, and make sure that they don't at some point uh, burst out and, and uh, start uh, social unrest. Well, it's a good question. Uh, you will probably keep, uh, keep them uh, under digital um, um, power so they don't um, start making trouble. These are real uh, issues. How do you um, manage change? Maybe people are having so much hope in innovation and technologies, but these are paradigm shifts. And uh, I think one of the basic uh, uh, problems is that uh, we believe that technology is going to solve everything. And this is a, a real problem, uh, all the more so as we don't uh, a company change. Even at university, we find uh, we find it hard to train our students to all these uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, for example, in in medicine, how do you train doctors uh, to all these new technologies? How many more years of studies do, will they have to do? I was thinking about another thing about plane um, uh, pilots. So don't really drive the plane anymore. They, if they, and for doctors, it could very well be the same. Uh, doctors nowadays they spend more time on their screen that, uh, than uh, discussing with you or looking at you. So what sort of freedom will they have to make decisions? These are fundamental questions, and I'm not convinced at all that with algorithm everywhere in the field of medicine, we will reduce the number of uh, examinations. Algorithms are everywhere, but they will probably uh, come up with uh, um, um, other suggestions for other examinations, and I'm not sure it's going to reduce the cost of uh, health care. I saw in the film and it's related to this idea, which is that, so if in pre-crime, you know, the, the police are starting to use these algorithms to come up with a list, again, even if someone hasn't committed a crime yet based on their associates. And I'm thinking, I'm seeing these two young gentlemen that are being profiled, and I'm thinking, you know, for every time that technology is used, 
spot for that reason. We need to be using that technology to figure out how to be supporting the education, the vocational skills, you know, the employment so that people can choose another path. You know, it's so unfair that you're deciding someone's path without giving them an option to choose another way, and the very same tools can be used. So this is the idea is that we're never going to get rid of the authoritarian idea of this, and we're never going to get rid of people exploiting it for profit. But there can be other people trained in this stuff that get in the game and say, hey, we're also going to use it for other reasons. You know, here is, here is one of the difficulties of what the situation now is, is a purely economic challenge, which is somebody calculated there are something like 120,000 people in the world total that can actually that understand AI and can put their fingers on a keyboard and do something with it. That's not many. Now, 15,000 work at Google, 20,000 at Amazon, 50,000 15, at Facebook, the same numbers in the three big Chinese companies, there are about 17 left. So if, 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 a, if a government needs to go out and find somebody to run their AI thinking and understanding, they can't find that person. Universities now don't have enough professors to teach because Uber comes in and, and, and hires the 60 AI specialists from Carnegie Mellon, and suddenly Carnegie Mellon cannot teach anymore. So there is no next generation being trained. That's the big challenge we have now. Yes and no. I mean, I, and this debate has you know, kind of been in other sectors as well, as which, well, I would definitely get a woman to be on my panel, but I couldn't find any. They're there, you just couldn't find them. And, but it is true that it, it doesn't, it's not just about finding people, it has to start from that root level of training people, engaging people, and encouraging people. And it starts with saying, we can all be part of this conversation, and that we all matter, and that we all have a voice. And so that is the problem, and there are solutions, but they're very deep-rooted and, and complicated. But there are people that are training women in coding, you know, people of color focused on that. It is happening, and they are there. And that's the magic of technology. There is someone out there who's simpatico with your ideas and that who wants to learn, but they need to be encouraged. And we all have a voice and we need to be encouraged to use it and we need to pull out the chair for someone else at the table. Okay. A uh, couple more questions. One here, there was one down the back. Okay, let's start with the lady up there. And then one, two, three. And then we will end the debate. Oui, bonsoir. Uh, uh, yes, uh, good evening. Uh, per, per, perhaps I'm, I'm going to go beyond my role. So it's, 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 not a, it's, not, it's not a question. It's not a question, but an answer I want to give. And uh, so the answer that came to mind after listening to you. So uh, AI and the big data uh, is a question of money, is a question of power. And if we want to be able to uh, intervene, to act, I'm wondering whether uh, there might not be another system, another solution than accepting the uh, universal basic income uh, subject that, that was uh, part of the debate uh, yesterday evening. It'll change life. It'll change the rapport versus work, uh, labor, the rapport to money, and uh, perhaps uh, so we could have, that would be the solution, and then again, you wouldn't have uh, all the power uh, in the hands of just a few engineers who are actually uh, designing the world uh, in our stead. Okay, we're not going to start on uh, yesterday evening's uh, debate. I mean, there's a school of thought that uh, says that uh, we should encourage uh, as much as we can the quick adoption of all the system. And to uh, and to have generalized unemployment, everybody would be unemployed, but everybody would have the universal basic income. Uh, so you know the value produced by the system, economic system, uh, or robotized, uh, and that would be distributed to everybody. The basic income, uh, the unconditional uh, basic income. There's a few economists who think that the unconditional basic income. So that w w the, the saying that this might be the solution. Go ahead. Uh, hi. My question would be, I think that there were a lot of great points that came from everyone. Um, if, as far as artificial intelligence, it is what it is. I mean, it's intelligent technology, but it still remains to be artificial, mm. which means that there's always humans that are behind this intelligence. So at the end of the day, um, there's always going to be a human behind it with a conscience, with their own values, with their own principles. So isn't it kind of idealistic to think that it will never be bias? Uh, this is a great question. And I think that um, I completely agree with you in that 
To be human is to be biased. There is no such thing as a blank slate. Let's say if you study this stuff your whole life, you're still born, and from the moment you're born, you're taking in information as, you know, from whatever demographic you're from, you're, you're learning as you go. So I think that the answer is absolutely there's no such thing as a blank slate. We all have our biases. The only thing we can do is be aware of them. We can be aware, for example, you know, we can be aware that eyewitness, eyewitness testimony across race is not accurate. Doesn't mean that if it's right in front of us, we're still not going to make the right choice, but we can say, wait a minute, we know that we have biases. And so you're exactly right. There is no blank slate. There is no technology without the human that made it, but we can say, okay, there's a bias here, so maybe we can have a diverse uh, group of people helping to check each other back and forth because no one person or company has the answer. There is a famous book published in Austria about 10 years ago which relates uh, an expedition in the North Pole by three Austrian young men. And when they came back, uh, each, three, each one was interviewed about the experience. There is nothing more identical than going out to the North Pole with two other people. Everybody does exactly the same steps and lives exactly the same experience. But the three stories are completely diverse, completely different. Uh, the way the, recoll the, the recollection was completely different, just to, to point out how bias are completely inherent. Yeah, and just to exactly what you said is a perfect example that um, there's so little we actually know about the brain we don't know exactly why we sleep. We don't know how memories work. So this idea of memory is what happens in a lot of mountaineering um, expeditions and just across life that, you know, memory is not fact. And so, again, just being aware of that can help us understand that just because I really believe it doesn't mean it's so. That's a really good example. Want to add something? Um, so I, th I think the point is exactly right, that humans are biased and humans are inputting data into these systems mm -hmm. um, so it can... It, it can often exacerbate or augment existing biases. What I would say is a lot of these examples that have come out in the last year, cu last couple of years, have really put this um, issue on the table. Um, you know, it's not something that people are not aware of about now. And I think what's happening now is a debate, one, about what design teams of algorithms look like. Um, so, um, as other people have been discussing, trying to diversify what that team looks like. And I think companies are starting to think we need more disciplines at the table and more experiences at the table. Um, I think what's also happening and needs to absolutely happen is that algorithms are tested at the very conceptualization stage um, before they even get out to market and tested and tested to see is there going to be any kind of bias, discrimination um, happening that we didn't intend to happen? Because obviously if we actually do intend for it to happen, that's automatically illegal. But um, is this algorithm um, going to produce unintended discrimination? And that's where impact assessments are really important and where the testing phase is really important. And so I think you know, that's where we need to move to, that, that before they get to market, they've really been tested and that there's strong oversight systems in place when they're running, when they're being deployed to test for um, these biases. So long. It's, it's like, you know, uh, when you actually uh, put uh, um, um, drugs on the market, uh, yeah, there's a lot of testing done, uh, but uh, uh, and there's a long list of uh, pr problems still met. We haven't read to, to reached the um, level of maturity of the, our industrialization that uh, governs our life. That's a problem now regarding the bias, and there's the attitude of the people, and the people should be able to make a sufficient effort to ask themselves questions uh, regarding uh, the information that might be manipulated. I mean, the human nature uh, is a quite lazy, uh, uh, and uh, I'm sort of overgeneralizing, and I'm not one, I wonder whether we're asking the right questions at the right time, especially we haven't been educated uh, to actually ask those questions. Uh, so uh, we have four minutes left, and we have two questions. Uh, okay, a quick question, quick answer. Thank you very much for what's been a very rich and thought-provoking discussion. My question's for Lorna. You said that you... Geneva has a role to play in this discussion. You'd suggested that the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner are already playing that role. It's hard to see. Um, but my question for you is, what is the role that you think the Geneva-based organizations, whether the political bodies like the Human Rights Council or the secretariat bodies like the Office of the High Commissioner or others like the ITU, what role do you see them playing? What contribution can they make to the discussion? Well, I, these are global issues. Um, 
first of all, the human rights impact is across all sectors, um, across all countries, um, and, it's, and it's happening in a global way um, with states, with companies, so there has to be some kind of international response. Um, so that's why I think Geneva is important. Geneva is the home of the human rights um, organs of the United Nations as well as other key agencies. So I think that for the human rights um, sector, it's about looking at how the international human rights law framework can be applied here um, and engaging um, with the space, looking at how these principles can be applied for this age um, through resolutions, through reports, um, looking at very concrete examples of how to ensure that states, that businesses are able to comply with their human rights obligations. Um, there is a framework there, um, and I think that it has to has to be in this space. Monsieur. I'll try to be brief. So we know, I think we all agree that the principal players of holding data is private companies, right? And I'm worrying a bit about regulation, so actually I believe that, and I hope you agree that regulation goes hand in hand with transparency. Now how transparency is actually in line with the secrecy of corporate businesses? So yes, I don't know how you envisage to um, attack that uh, issue. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Lorna. Well, I think that there's, you know, there's a big debate about this right now, about the propriety interest um, and how this is actually dealt with. So I think there's there's a lot of debate about it wouldn't have to be the whole code um, that is revealed. Um, there's also discussions about what oversight bodies could look like um, that would be able to assess the impact um, on human rights while protecting. Um, the proprietary interests and the competitive interests of companies. So I think there's really a lot of work going on about how to achieve that because it is a, it's a key challenge, but it's not an insurmountable challenge. And I exactly what Lorna said, which is um, there is no one answer to that question other than right now it hasn't been a priority. So we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, which part of the code, again, some of the developers aren't understanding as much as the AIs about how things are built. But can it be a core part of what we understand to be important for us all to be a part of this discussion? And that, you know, one of the issues, again, is that the AI is being developed in very siloed, specific, separated places that haven't come to any type of understanding as to how much this is going to affect all of us. And so there, it's a very complicated question. One of the answers that we can start with is that needs to be a priority. Priority. And we need to understand that that is part of what we do, that we're not just trudging ahead and building things without understanding that that's important. Solange, le mot de la fin. Yes, one very last word, Solange. I do think it is a priority and it needs uh, to be openly and very um, uh, transparently discussed, and everyone is uh, defending their interests, of course. But maybe we should replace the notion of interest by that of value. Uh, we need an authentic discussion. We need to find uh, together um, acceptable solutions for a better life, uh, to, for technological uh, progress to become a social progress as well. And I'm not sure we're going that way. Thank you very much. Uh, we had uh, until 8 o'clock. It is now 8 o'clock, so thank you very much to all of you.